Welcome back to Elise TV. I love that you keep coming back to see us. This is a lot of fun for us. The, the response and the input has been a lot of fun as well, so it sounds like you appreciate some of our madness out here. Um, we are going to be talking about Chardonnay today, and before you red wine drinkers log off immediately, <laughs> man, calm down. Uh, Chardonnay is an important foundation for all winemaking that happens anywhere in the world. It's one of those grapes that's kind of almost like the canary in a coal mine, for lack of a better reference, where Chardonnay gets kind of planted in a lot of new areas first uh, to see if it's viable for, for winemaking and grape growing, and then from there they can decide other things. So some of the Chardonnay was kind of our our avant-garde forefront guy before a lot of the Cabernets that a lot of people enjoy today uh, uh, come around. Um, one quick thing about Chardonnay is it is so malleable depending on the style a winery wants to promote. There isn't sort of a baseline Chardonnay and everybody makes a version of that. It is often referred to as a winemaker's grape because every decision you make on Chardonnay is reflected in that finished wine. From super high butter and super high oak and super high alcohol to the Chablis of Burgundy to the sparkling versions of Champagne. I mean, it really is a, as a, as a, again, we go back to the word manly bone. It's a grape that can be shaped in a lot of different directions in a lot of different ways. Um, Elise Winery uh, has been making Chardonnay since, God, the, the late 90s, early 2000s. And most of the style of Elise has always been to go a little less on the oak and a little bit more on the vineyard um, personality. And, and, and the, the nature of how the wines were made, instead of uh, sort of pushing a vineyard to create more butter or more acid or this kind of thing, the style here was to find different vineyards to play with. One vineyard would give you weight and body. One vineyard would give you aromatics. One vineyard would give you kind of that luxurious texture. So it was always interesting to see them kind of seeking out different Chardonnay vineyards. Um, of all the wines that we play with in the wine world, I think for us from a farming standpoint, Chardonnay can be one of the most diverse. You really right. see a, a vast difference a lot of times in, in the locations and in, in, in the Chardonnays um, that you enjoy out there. Elisa's style has always been to go a little bit less on that butter scale, a little bit less on that oak scale, and really let the clarity of the vineyard and the acidity of the wine play a major role. That being said, that also lends a style of Chardonnay that's going to age differently than some of the larger uh, buttery, you know, butterier? Is that a word? You just made one. I say, if Dr. Seuss can make up words, so can we, man. Butter he can corner butter. the market. Um, <laughs> and so... A lot of people that we come across in our wine drinking adventures will talk about, I don't like a buttery Chardonnay as soon as you go to pour them one, because you kind of get it into your head that that's what all Chardonnay is going to be like. Um, I got to tell you, the Elise style is really a beautiful dinner party friendly, sip it on the back porch style of Chardonnay. Um, so today we are going to start with the 2013 Chardonnay, and this was such a Powerhouse Cabernet Vineyard. Let's see if there's any way to turn that off. Um, it's always fascinating to try white wine from a vintage that was so popular for red wine. Um, and again, those of you that are red wine drinkers out there, stop immediately trying to log off on me, man. You're going to pay attention to this and you're going to drink some white wine with us. These wines and, are beautiful. And I really, really, really want you guys. Now, I will tell you. Our promise to you is always the wines that we drink are always going to be available. Today is going to be slightly different because we're experimenting a little bit with that vision of ageability and drinkability when it comes to Chardonnay. So I'm not going to confuse anybody out there, but of all the Chardonnays we're going to try, these six today, it's the 16, 17, and 18 vintage, the current kind of release Chardonnays that are absolutely available at the winery. Um, I will tell you, there is a little bit of this 01 available. We'll try at the very end. An 01. We are trying an almost 20 year old Chardonnay. You can it's going see to be this. It's been tried and true. Absolutely. And it's really going to be fun to, to see that evolve and continue to evolve. In my opinion, that 01 has not hit its peak. I, I really feel like it's, it could keep going for a few more years as well. I'd love to blind taste um, some, some master psalms or advanced psalms on this and see how many take it to Burgundy because. It is made in that style, and it's aging. Beautiful. The aromatics on the 13, again, in typical style of this house, have really come together. Um, you're not getting the competition of oak. You're not getting the competition of the the kind of the malolactic and the butter and the, the sensation. You really are getting this harmonious, got honeysuckle and pear tartatan and... Uh, Soft, creamy palate, 
but not from heavy malolactic. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we were, we will eventually talk about, and it seems appropriate to talk about it now, that we decided in the 2013 vintage to add a little bit of Pinot Blanc. And I think that's where a lot of this weight starts to come from in the mid palate without having to do extensive malolactic yeah. fermentation. So you keep the fresh vibrancy and a word you like to say, verve. Yes. It has it. I can't do it without um, my eyebrows going up. You say verb and like they immediately go up. I don't know what that is, man. You know? um, yeah, and Pinot Blanc is interesting. You know, California, we talk a lot about how serious we are about grape growing and wine making these days. Pinot Blanc was mixed in with Chardonnay all over the world. Burgundy will never admit openly that they had to go through and pull a lot of vines out of some of those old Chardonnay vineyards because there was a lot of Pinot Blanc interwoven in there. And, and some appellations really had to further define what made their appellation unique because they're like, man, this is really good. Like, why is it so different from that next door neighbor's vineyard? It's like, well, you got Pinot Blanc mixed in there. Um, for those of you, as you get out there and experiment and drink more wines, we'll play with a kind of an alternate selection show down the road. We'll play with the Pinot Blancs a little bit. Don't be afraid to try these if you're a Chardonnay and a Sauvignon Blanc lover. Pinot Blanc by its nature has some weight to it. And so the decision to add that to the Chardonnay was, again, the weight that the malolactic, that buttery sensation that can bring uh, uh, the weight to a Chardonnay. Pinot Blanc played that role in, uh, in a lot of these vintages. And then as time went by, we started loving the Pinot Blanc so much that we pulled it back out of the Chardonnay and started bottling it separately. And that was a really fun uh, move. It, it, it often illustrates for us that the vineyard can really dictate the wines that it wants to be made into and not us continuing to make a style because that's what we want. Mm -hmm being sensitive enough to listen to the vineyard and the, and the wines and the, the way they want to be made. The acidity on this 13 is just delicious. I mean, this is bright, it is, it is refreshing. Um, I definitely feel that this particular vintage for me makes me think of the coast. So rather than deep sea oily fish, I'm thinking more like my scallops and my mussels mm -hmm. and Dungeness crab and that kind of thing. It has this kind of coastal salinity for lack of a better uh, geek term. Uh, you do well with those. That was just for you guys at Psalm Select, by the way, man. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, boys. Yeah, this 13 is beautiful, amazing, versatile pairing wine. Sadly, like he said earlier, we have none of it. So I'm glad we found a bottle um, because it's aging beautifully. Seven year old Sonoma Chardonnays, really good ones, are drinking beautifully right now. But then there's some that are made in a different style that were very pleasing in the beginning and maybe are starting to fall off, but this has light years of life ahead of it. Of all the wines that I think we focus on in terms of a library and having multiple vintages available, I think the one Achilles heel for a lot of us wineries is Chardonnay. I don't know that we preserve and save it the same way we do other varietals and, and kind of go deep in the library. And there's always that push to drink that current fresh release Chardonnay. And I have been pleasantly proven wrong over and over again over the years, especially by houses like Stony Hill, uh, Mayakama, uh, Monolena, some of these Hansel wines. And oh, Sonoma. the Hanzels. God bless you guys, man, you know. Um, I mean, you could almost credit Hanzel for making Chardonnay a viable, popular California wine. And it wasn't until the Hanzels, what was it, like the 1950s, where they really started launching their Chardonnays and the popularity started to grow. That gave enough momentum for Chardonnay to be planted by other growers. It made it more popular to make into wine. And so that's why it was one of those feet forward we took in Paris. It's exactly yeah. why I went to Paris. If the if the Hansels hadn't have been so brave, if the Wente family hadn't have been so brave, you mm -hmm. know, uh, there wouldn't have been that foot forward to show the rest of the world that we were yeah. And it's funny that we show Chardonnay to show the world that we were serious about winemaking. Yeah. You know, it's funny that that was the grape that became that personality of if you can make a good Chardonnay, we'll take you seriously. You know? Yeah, that is interesting because it wasn't taken as seriously here in California, Sonoma, Napa, wherever. Another one of those wineries that I was just reading about, Kenwood Winery, which is now Kundi. Oh, yeah. Um, Certainly helps. So. <laughs> like the cookies. Certainly Kundi. Oh, Kundi. Oh, the, uh, you know, the, the, it's one of those great things about, I think, some of these older family farms is seeing generation after generation. Uh, the Smith mm -hmm. uh, uh, Ranch in the Dry Creek Valley has been the absolute cornerstone of the Elise Chardonnays. Um, and you know, you you start looking at the Ramazzotti family has been doing the farming uh, for the group and the Ramazzotti's have been late 1800s uh, uh, Italian uh, farmers in, in Sonoma and especially the Dry Creek area. 
And again, it's funny to see that for all the farming that they do, Chardonnay is still one of the aspects of, of the pride that they take. And, and the quality of the Chardonnay that we get from them has a lot to do with that. For those of you that want to go further down the rabbit holes, we tried these other Chardonnays. There are a million styles of Chardonnay out there. This particular style is known as Robert Young. This is a Wente Selection Chardonnay that was played with in the vineyards over the years. And, and the reference to plant material being cleaned up is just that every new plant being moved across this planet or from one place to the other can change its personality or the way it reacts to the flora and the fauna and the wildlife around it. So Robert Young was a version of Wente uh, Chardonnay. And the Wente family from the Central Valley of Livermore, um, Mr. Wente, way back in the day, uh, one of the winemakers for Charles Krug before the turn of the century, Wow. Found out there was land available in that Livermore area and then went and bought his land and started his family legacy that way. And was one of those crazy guys working with Mr. Krug, uh, brought Chardonnay over. So I want to say 1918, 1912, think about this era in America. He brought some of that early Chardonnay stuff over from France and that became known, of course, as the Wente Selections. That's exactly where that reference came from. Um, so now we're moving up to the 15. Uh, 15 is a vintage was, it was us kind of getting in to the middle of our drought years. So 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, as drought affected red wine grapes, but they became super powerful, super, you know, color rich wine. When it comes to white wine, you can get smaller grapes, which makes a little thicker texture. There's a weight and, a, and an intensity that picks up with those drought vintages. And you really see the difference between that 13 and that 15. Agreed. 13 being the first drought of year, but we had enough rain to get us a little over that cusp. By 15, we hadn't seen a drop in years or enough rain to recover. So you really pick up a little bit more of that almost, um, what is it, that, like that lanolin. Almost, there's almost that, uh, yeah, there's no semion in it, but it has that semion kind of quality <laughs> of, uh, of style to the wine. Yeah, weight, texture. Uh, the acidity is beautiful for a vine that was struggling without water. Uh, the complexity oh, is beautiful, which... You don't always talk about the complexity in white wine. That's usually terroir driven, um, not necessarily vintage driven. Um, but this 15 is is got yeah. all sorts of character. That's a great shape today too. Are we having like one of those fruit flower days? I can never, uh, you know, day. yeah. Another thing I want to say about the 15, if any of the viewers out there were lucky enough to find some of the packages that Cheryl put together online, it flew off the shelves, so now this is why this is one of the wines that we're going to taste today that isn't available again. The 16, 17, 18. Oh, Sorry, uh, but for those of you lucky ones, you're gonna you're gonna really appreciate. Lean close to your computer. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that 15 smells like, man. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Lund Smell of <laughs> at Elise TV. Um, it um, the weight of the 15 now takes me away from the coast. And now I'm thinking more hoofed. I can actually see myself going more in the in the, the pork uh, kind of porterhouse or pork shoulder world. Um, as that weight picks up more flavors, I want to start thinking about doing more root vegetables or that kind of thing with the 15. It just has that. Um, and sometimes with that weight, it makes it more satisfying to sit and drink on its own too. Sometimes the acidity of a wine like the 13 makes you think food. Sometimes the weight of another vintage will go, I can actually just sit and, and kill a couple glasses of that. And sometimes when Christopher Lund mentions the word hoofed, don't even know exactly totally what it means, but it, I picture him yesterday climbing up one of our steep mountain vineyards, <laughs> hoofing it up the vineyard. Uh, that's the only thing I had in my mind. So when I used to organize my menus, I would do it by zone. So it was the ocean, the forager, the, the pasture, uh, the rancher. And so when I say hoofed, I'm saying I can now take a more protein-based inland version okay. of dishes and things that I would pair with that Chardonnay, whereas the coast for me is thinking more about the scallops and the shellfish and the... Uh, yeah. I, I just, the word pork porterhouse just keeps popping in my head. <laughs> I'm sorry, but there it is, man, you know? In the um, end, eat what you like, drink what you like. So if you want to pair a 2016 Chardonnay with a porterhouse steak, by all means. And please, on. the thing that we love the most as a winery is we get to meet a lot of people. We all have a lot of fun getting to know each other and certainly being part of each other's wine drinking lives. It never gets old for us, especially in this modern era of social media. Um, 
photographs of our enthusiasts around the table with friends. Yeah. You know, and that look, but there's our bottle, and they're having some of the great We've been times getting of so many of those, so thank you out yeah. there, all the Elise. Uh, we'll all get through drinkers, this together, one glass at a time. Yeah, it's absolutely. awesome seeing all your social media posts, and oh. there have been, I can't even count. So thank you. The so, brightness of this 16 now takes. The aromatics and the acidity of the 13 I love, the weight of the 15 I love, and put it into one glass. With I freshness. Love. Yeah. This is super fresh and vibrant. The Pinot Blanc in these wines, and so the percentage was only about 5 to 10 at its height, I want to say. But it evolves on a separate timeline as the Chardonnay. So it's interesting for me to see some of the Chardonnay is perfect. And the Pinot Blanc hasn't come around yet, and watching the two of them kind of match up. This 16 is absolutely ready to rock and roll right yeah, now. Yeah, I feel, and you mentioned the Pinot Blanc, and I feel like I I feel it and taste it more in this 16, even than the 13 and 15s, and the freshness of this wine is pretty fantastic. Oftentimes when you look at this 16, this is a perfect example of a learning curve as well. I knew I had problems with the drought in 13, 14, and 15. I'd learned what the vineyard was going to give me. I knew what kind of reduction we were going to see. Let's adjust some of our perception and some of our winemaking to sort of capture that. And I think the 16 shows that understanding and the ability to kind of keep up and, and subtly modify your uh, technique or style sometimes to keep up with what Mother Nature's kind of throwing at you. But once again, the freshness of this 16 is um, is really... it. it, it um, it has almost, when I think about those fancier restaurants that use the microgreens, it has that kind of like sherbet, fresh, oh my God. Micro watercress. My daughters picked up on this right away. They're like, fancy restaurants, it's tweezers. I can always <laughs> tell. The chef's got those tweezers in there, man. I already know we're in a next level restaurant, you know? But I think about the, the freshness of the herbs when it comes to this, and this one almost makes me want garden. Mm. You know, if I'm going to pair this with a course, I'm thinking all about spring produce and yeah. You know, peach season's coming. This one makes oh. me think about grilled peaches kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Whether it's gorgonzola yeah. or goat cheese or whatever you want. Oh. And arugula with a little pepperiness. Just saying. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, had a, I had an amazing uh, kale salad from Rutherford Grill takeout nice. last night. Uh, thank you guys. That salad is off the chain. You get up here into the valley in July, Brasswood Restaurant, north of St. Helena, the grilled peaches with the burrata mm -hmm. cheese uh, salad is, is a must for a wine like this for sure. Yeah. yeah, and also the just it's fun being back in Napa, and now I've been back in Napa for 10 years. Won't get into before, but vintage after vintage starting to see firsthand what was happening during that time and like he said 12 13 14 15 were all considered drought years 16 kind of gets lumped in there but we got rain the winter of 15 and 16 so replenished kind of some water tables that ground soaked it up well after some floods um but have to think that that had some effect on this wine which is just gorgeous yeah and chardonnay by its nature it typically likes vineyard locations that are close to a water source. They love to keep their feet wet. You know, if you go to Burgundy, the hillsides are very um, absorbent. They sort of tend to retain their water. Um, in some parts of the Napa Valley, it almost seems counterintuitive to see Chardonnay planted high up in the mountains. But the nature of how our mountains work out here, there are these high mountain plains that collect water. There are clay deposits, and you'll often find these little pockets of Chardonnay that love to keep its feet wet and a little bit of a little bit of clay and water out there. You're gonna hear the word loam a lot. This is just usually those fluffy soils next to the river that you can spit out a watermelon seed and grow watermelons later that summer. So they, they don't mind a little nutrient kind of rich uh, soil, but it is a typically of all the grape varieties you can grow, Chardonnay is a pretty vigorous vine. Mm -hmm. So you've gotta be a little more aggressive about pruning her down because it will shrub out on you big time because it wants to, it, it has a, a, a huge intention of growing tons of leaves and wanting to become this prolific vine. So building on that, um, I would expect that you know this. No Where question. did Chardonnay come from? What two parent grapes All right. came up with Chardonnay? You talked about the like workhorse. Yeah. All right. Where does it come All from? you master psalms out there, flip through your books right now. Uh, turn to page 17. Uh, this is, uh, if, if you want, we, it's really funny that we were talking about uh, Croatia and the origins of Zinfandel in, in, in our first show. Chardonnay has its roots in Croatia as well. Ooh, there is a varietal called Guaz Blanc 
uh, that originated kind of out of that uh, Croatian uh, region for growing grapes. And, and the quick sidebar story is, is, is the, the Guaz, the G-O-U, for anybody that speaks actual French, you have to mm -hmm. help me out with that one. But this was a little bit of a slang. They considered Chardonnay to be a lesser uh, peasant wine. So the Guaz Blanc was this peasant varietal, and it would be planted in vineyards right next to the, the, the royalties Pinot Noir vineyard. So it didn't take long for farmers to take a well-performing lesser grape next to this fancy guy's grape and literally Chardonnay to this day. Thank you, UC Davis, Dr. Meredith. Um, it is a, a plant that was crossbred, so Guaz Blanc and, uh, and Pinot Noir became Chardonnay. Um, old school, California, they used to refer to it as Pinot Chard. You yes. will still see old references to that on totally. some old bottles. Um, and for the longest time, they didn't know what Chardonnay was, and it was oftentimes, and I think you touched on this earlier, confused for Pinot Blanc. Um, and it wasn't really planted around Sonoma area until the 1880s. And then, like you said earlier, that 1976 really put it on the map and all of a sudden yeah. it was I mean, to give you an idea of what Guas Blanc did back in the day as a workhorse grape, its closest cousin that's probably still around is that French Columbard. Oh, wow. Now imagine what kind of steely green high acid wines that that makes. And that was the parent that gave you kind of that acidity profile and some of the aromatics. And of course, Pinot brought the weight and the flesh and the, and the um, kind of aromatics as well. Yeah, I feel like here in Napa, those French Columbard was actually pretty prevalently planted here. And Chenin Blanc was probably the most planted white grape here in Napa. Chateau Le Grand Roche reforming you out there, man. The old, old what is it, Old Vine Days Off French Columbard, man. I used to bottle that. Uh, that's early or it's not? Uh, you know, back in the 80s, 90s, 90s, okay. I'd say. Um, so now we've got this 17 Chardonnay that we're trying, and I gotta tell you, this is where I think you get a return to the 13 in style. The acidity on the 17 has got a little bit more personality in this one. There is a little less weight in terms of the, the, the 15 there. Um, the 17 is really showing a little electricity right now. Um, Mouth-watering acidity. It is showing sooner, in my opinion, its balance than, than I think some of these others that took a few more years to kind of bring all the components together. Um, the 17 for me of everything I've tasted so far is my standalone Chardonnay. Like I could just simply drink a glass of this on its own uh, and talk about how great it is to be us for another day. Sniff, sip, repeat, over and over for us. It's kind of sniff, 45 degree one, one, tilt, pound, fill, you know, fill. whatever word you need. Um, unfortunately, it is a cork, so it's not as commuter friendly as some of the screw caps out there, but we're, we're working on that. Um, Chardonnay, I mean, again, my goodness, uh, it's one of those things that's funny. As we have people come visit the winery, there are certain things when you say Cabernet, people get excited, or you say Zin, people like, oh my God, I love Zin. You say Chardonnay, man, there is there is no fence. You know, people are like, Chardonnay, great! Like, I'm here to drink Chardonnay. Or you say Chardonnay, and they're like, oh, yeah, really, no, I just don't know. I'm on that, I'm on that <laughs> side of that fence, usually, where Chardonnay, California Chardonnay, there's maybe five to 10 producers that I actually want to drink their Chardonnay. And that's why this is fun for me because we get to go back to 13, 15, 01, hopefully soon. Um, and we knew what we were doing. Yeah. Well, I, pretty awesome. I think part of it as well is when you start making Chardonnays in a bigger and bigger California style, you're having to bring a lot more French oak into that equation to make this really well-structured powerhouse Chardonnay. We're, it's still a business, man. If I'm bringing French oak into the equation, that's going to reflect on the price. And I think Chardonnay has always had a little bit of that, let's say, chip on its shoulder, for lack of a better word, because of the expense of some of those bottles. If I'm a wine drinker and I've got $75 burning a hole in my pocket and I want to buy a big bad Chardonnay or I want to buy a big bad red, oftentimes I think you'll find yourself leaning towards that red. Now, for those of you that are whiskey drinkers out there, this is an interesting thing about oh, yeah. Chardonnay that I love. Or beer drinkers. Oak is one of the things we love about whiskey. We love the caramels and the toffees and the cinnamons and the nutmegs and everything that oak brings to a good whiskey. Chardonnay, because of the transparency of being a white varietal instead of a red wine, 
typically shows those sweeter oak notes as a companion profile to the wine. And you will be surprised if you are a Reposado tequila fan, if you are a whiskey drinker, you go out and try one of these big bad Chardonnays and you'll be amazed how much you will love these. There's something about that oak that talks to part of your soul that'll really, uh, I think, make you happier than you might have gone in expecting. Did you jump ahead on the 18 on me? I haven't tasted it yet. See, you needed you to finish bad. your 17 Sorry. so I couldn't pour for you. Ah. Uh, but I liked where you were going with all of this with the 17 and you're talking about big bad Chardonnays because now this 18 gets into a big bad Chardonnay maker who is our winemaker, Russell Bevan. Russell? And there was something else that you said that really kind of took me to this. Oh, the, the new French oak influence, because yeah. all of these wines, very similar in production as far as new French oak, and it's only about 20, 30 yeah. percent, super low on the mallow. Again, we have the Pinot Blanc blended in to carry that weight so we can preserve that vibrant yes. malic acid acidity from the Chardonnay. This amazingly balanced. This is 50-50, 50% new French oak, which is, by Napa terms and Sonoma terms, pretty low. However, it's going to have a little yeah. different. Tell us what you're going to do. No, I, just, it's funny, I wanted you to touch on that. You, you did a, a great job with it, which is, I think sometimes we say things in our business and we skip right over it. So when we say 50% new, 30% new, if I'm going to make 10 barrels of Chardonnay, that means that five of those barrels are brand new. They've never had any wine in them before. And so the oak flavors are going to be more prominent. Every time we make wine in a barrel, we're going to reduce some of our barrels multiple times. And it takes the flavor strength down every time we use it so we can balance out power in our oak program just like we can in the vineyard. So new, when we refer to new oak in a wine, that's exactly the reference is newer barrels. Quick touching on malolactic. I know we skip over these words sometimes. Uh, quick explanation of malolactic is... If you put a Granny Smith green apple on one side of the table and a glass of milk on the other, and take a bite out of the Granny Smith apple, and then take a sip out of the milk, we get to make a decision in texturing a wine. After it's pulled out of the vineyard, we now texture it in the cellar with oak and this malolactic decision. Malolactic is a process after the wine has been fermented. It is bone dry. There's no sugar left in this wine. Malolactic fermentation, as it's referred to, starts to play with the acidity of a wine. I can keep it super Granny Smith green apple and not induce any malolactic, and you get those really lean, you know, uh, and typically the less ML you employ, the less new oak you employ, because I want that leanness to reflect as refreshment in the wine and not fight the, the new oak. Then you look at that scale, that dial can keep moving closer and closer and closer to that glass of milk all the way on that spectrum and get those super buttery, creamy, rich Chardonnays. They all have their place. They all have their fans out there. So malolactic, malic like a green apple, lactic like a glass of milk. So malolactic fermentation is deciding between those two elements where you want that acidity. And profile just like your Christopher mind. was illustrating about the amount of new French oak, you have your 10 barrels, go back to that example, 10 barrels. One barrel goes through 100% malolactic, we're saying of Chardonnay. The other nine barrels stay that malic acid is totally preserved. Then you blend them together, now you have a wine that has gone through 10% malactic fermentation. Wow. You put your eight nose into this 18 and you're immediately thinking, wow, this is gonna be such an oak-driven monster Chardonnay. The acidity is gorgeous in here. It is refreshing. It is, mm. it takes the oak and runs with it without making it a dominant factor. Um, this one's almost got me in kind of the, the almond world like yeah. now i'm thinking about like this almond roco or i'm thinking about this like almond crusted something or i'm like it brings me to this forest so to speak uh, if i'm speaking in my, my yeah and the, but the, the apples and the pears are still fresh and vibrant as opposed to when you let any grape hang longer you're going to get riper flavors so with chardonnay the longer you let the grapes hang it will turn from that Granny Smith apple into maybe red apples into more baked apples. Um, there's nothing baked about these apples. They are fresh, red delicious-ish. Um, this is uh, this is caramelized and apple pear. spoon bread to go with pork chops. That's exactly what this is. <laughs> this is wow. an amazing wine and. I don't. I won't speak for you, but I am, and you've known him. If you're gonna speak for me. You have to do it in a funny voice. 15 years longer than <laughs> But Russell Bevan is an amazing addition to this winery. Um, 
and I'm just super excited. The more wines that I taste that he's made of ours, what you, what you just said sparked that in me is it's amazing the balance he has between flavors, aromatics, but also real fresh acidity. And it's just, he has balance on point in spades. Um, and that comes back to adventure. Now we want to talk about the future. Chardonnay vineyards have become very much farmed like Cabernet vineyards in that mm. I want to attach a family name to this bottle. I want the world to know that this Chardonnay came from this site. Now, a, a farmer can sell their grapes to anybody and they can put that name on the bottle, but you can't control the impact that that wine's going to have. So the impact you want to have as a farmer in terms of your ego, and this is not a bad word, um, has a lot to do with the winemakers that you want to put those grapes in the hands of to achieve a certain level. So the future for us, 2018 by the way, this was the first vintage since the 2013, we took the Pinot Blanc back out. There was such a purity, we got some rain in 18 in the spring finally, the Chardonnay vineyards were happy. So we brought a pure Chardonnay back to the equation in 2018 and bottled the Pinot Blanc separately. Uh, that, uh, for the Elise Club members that are watching today, that was your spring shipment. That wine is never going to see the light of day because of how little uh, Pinot Blanc we really made. But it was really fascinating to try the two side by side and see the component that, that the Pinot Blanc had brought to that equation um, over time. So now as we look to the future, 2019, 2020, 2021, we've now got the, the Sampatago Ranch involved. We're going back to Kent Ritchie. We're going back to the Rued family, and these are epic, epic, epic Chardonnay locations. And, and so the diversity of what we're playing with out there um, will create a more exciting Elise Chardonnay, but it will also give us some avenues. And those of us that have come and played with us here at the winery realize there are other projects afoot and, and other things to explore. But at some level, we need the wine drinker to be part of the process because as we play, it's notorious to come and visit us. Uh, and you drink the wines, and we're like, here's this juice pitcher full of something. We're tinkering with this. Do you like this? Is this good? You know? And so we're always playing with these new vineyards to see if we know we like them, but we want to see the, the guest reaction. And, and, and um, uh, you know, no matter how much you make wine in a, in a uh, scientific or an artistic realm, you're still making wine for people to enjoy and drink. And so the ability to proofread your work, I think, is the toughest thing we do. So it's the interplay with Wine Drinker that allows us that proofreading to go, yeah, I think we're on the right track and I think we're making a good wine. Um, this 18, and by the way, have fun with this. Put together a 16, 17, 18, like mix six pack. So you got two of everything. Play around with this at dinner. It can really be interesting to have the same couple of dishes in the middle of the table. Yeah and play around with the different vintages and see how they'll actually react to the same food differently as a vintage. Um, it can really be a fun uh, way to uh, uh, ease the pain if you've got a really painful group of people around your table. Yeah, yeah. fish is great. <laughs> Greens are great, like he was saying with the peaches. And the, I mean, take take the, the fruits that shine in these wines. And with Chardonnay, a lot of times it's apples and peaches, stone fruit. So whether that's apricot and you know, you never know. Play around with salads with that, and then play around with the different cheeses. And Persimmon, I love root vegetables. I love playing with those uh, with shards. Now, again, I hate to do this to you. We don't often do this. The 01, it is available, okay? And I'm talking like maybe a couple of cases on the planet. What? More like a case and a half on the planet. I help him do the inventory, but he is the final <laughs> sayer, so. So, if like 12 of you jump on it, there'll be an 01 available to you. Um, and you can see uh, it, the color has not gone crazy. It has not completely. As a matter of fact, normally when you see a 20-year-old white wine, you'll start to see color change and, and a little bricking around the corner. This is in vibrant, perfect shape. I mean, this is really amazing. I, I could not, I'll just be 100% honest, I could not have had lower expectations of a 20 year old show. <laughs> Me there, too. You know? I was like, all right, let's just do this, man. You know? Okay, we gotta and fill up 30 minutes. We pulled the cork on this, and I gotta tell you, man, it was delicious. It, it, it is delightful. a vibrant shape. Uh, 
Cubby's reference earlier to blinding it with somebody is we can have that preconceived notion like me going, there's no way I'm going to like this. If I take all of that away and simply just brought you this glass of wine and made you try it, I would be amazed how many people would pick 20 years old as what this wine is in this glass. And really possibly impressive. old world. And, and when this was made back in, in 01, this was almost 15% alcohol. That was a massive move for that era. We had not really reached that level uh, until uh, years later. And that's higher than any of the wines that we've tasted this way, which surprised us, and we just really oh. found that out today. That I mean, old one is, is picked up uh, uh, weight. Now, I will tell you this about drinking older vintages, and this is where things start to change in terms of the culture of wine drinking. Newer, fresher wine, I can open these and drink them two days later and they're still delicious and still gorgeous. There's a lot of toys out there on the market, the Coravan, the, the pumps, all these things are preserva wine. It's not necessary for new vintages. Well-made wine, the way Elise has been producing Chardonnay, should do fine for a couple of days, just pulling a cork and letting it do its thing. Keeping it in the fridge, if you're... When you back. get to things like an 01 Chardonnay, they are gorgeous. They are in great shape. They are drinkable. But I will tell you, there is a bell curve that works with these older wines. So if we're going to enjoy something like the 01, you literally go, cork, glass, awesome. You know, a day later, this is not going to be the same, you know, uh, beauty queen she is right yeah, now. Yeah, you can see how it opens over 30 minutes, an hour, but you don't, like he said, check it the next day and say, oh, it's going to be so much better. Um, for those of you that are just now kind of being entertained by these shows and have kind of had a chance to, to log on and, and have some fun with us, we are going to be uploading the previous episode so you can catch up and see some of the fun ones. If any of you missed the show with uh, mm -hmm. with Russell earlier in the week, that was, uh, that was awesome. a blast. Um, and don't be afraid to, to jump out and shoot us some questions during the, uh, the broadcast as well. Um, any of the Q&A that you want to be involved with, we'd be more than happy to address, uh, certainly during the show, or we'll address it during the, the, the next one. Um, you know, I would love to announce what our show is going to be on Tuesday, but we'll figure it out on Tuesday. Yeah, just like you day. guys, I don't know what kind of wine I want to drink on Tuesday yet, so we'll, we'll have to play with that when the, when the, the time comes. Yeah, um, and piggybacking on what Christopher just said, uh, Christopher can carry, if you know Christopher, he can carry a room. Let him let him talk. He's amazing. I love mentoring under him because I learned so much not only about wine but about all sorts of things. The more questions you ask, the more I'll get to talk. Because <laughs> otherwise, I'm just gonna admire him and his beauty. So, you red wine drinkers, get in on some Chardonnay and stop being so proud of yourself. Uh, you Chardonnay drinkers, get on this little trio, and uh, don't be afraid to play with that 01 if you want to try something a little more unique. We've had um, a request for Cesse Sivan on Tuesday. Oh, a, a Ooh, Cesse Sivan request. Oh, let's do it. Let's do it. I say, oh, oh, we used to use that Nagier vineyard. Yeah. I don't know how you really pronounce that, uh, but uh, we? we've got some older vintage stuff. Should we make Tuesday the alternate red day? Ooh, let's play with Ficante, yeah. let's play with Nero Misto, let's play with... Uh, Whoa, I don't know if you've been on our website either. Cheryl has some crazy deals on some Ficante and Nero Misto, and we are actually constantly taking deliveries from our warehouse back to the winery because we can't keep it in stock. So, yeah, maybe I think that's a great idea. That'd be a fun one. Huh? Maybe we'll bring out some of the older uh, Le Corbeaux, maybe. Ooh. Oh. Oh my goodness. goodness. All right. So guys, we'll see That's you on a, Tuesday next week. Thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers, bud.